as you are able in body or spirit, I would invite you to please rise. We begin with the words that were spoken and the sign that was marked upon us in our baptism when we were declared God's sons and daughters and brothers and sisters to each other. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us call to mind the need we all have for God's mercy. Lord Jesus, you call us to repentance and forgiveness. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you call us to embrace our neighbors with love. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you call us to leave the shadows and walk in the light. Lord, have mercy. This is the good news. God is mercy, and in the name of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Let us join our voices and sing our gathering song, Blessed Assurance, hymn number 638. Sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair and deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in faith the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Church of Rome, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 5th verse. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? 
that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Alleluia! The crowds were rejoicing at the wonderful things Jesus was doing. Alleluia! The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me! And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I would invite you to be seated. Dear fellow believers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we look at this text, let's stop for a moment and put it into the context of what we've been hearing. For the last few weeks, we've been listening to Jesus tell parables and then with a short interlude, telling the disciples what the parables are about. We've heard parables about the sower and the seed. We've heard parables about the sower, the seed, and the soil. And then when Jesus was done with that, he kind of slid his disciples into the parables of the kingdom of God with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then the parable. And then last week, before we get to the parable's conclusion, Jesus hears that his cousin, John the Baptizer, has been beheaded. And so he takes off, he departs, and he gets into a boat to go to the other side of the sea, and when he gets there, the crowds had already gone ahead, circled around, and caught him. 
So he had them sit down and he taught them. And as you remember, at the end of the day, it was getting dark. The disciples looked at Jesus and said, you better send them away so they can go home and get something to eat. And remember how that unfolded? Jesus says, no, you feed them. And that takes place. And so now this is at the end of that story, the end of the death of John the baptizer, the end of the kingdom of heaven is like parables, the end of the parables of sowing and seed and soil and things of that nature. And what we find here is that Jesus puts his disciples in that boat that he had used to traverse the sea. And then he says basically, I'll be right back. And he disperses the crowd and he says, you've had your fill. Your bellies are full, your ears are full, and your spirit has been taken, home, taken care of. So now go, in his own gentle and divine way. He dismisses them, the crowds leave, and now is his chance. He departs and he goes up the mountain by himself to pray. We ought not lose sight of that because you see, going up the mountain is how ancient Israel lived out their relationship with God. They went to the mountain and up it in order to be in the presence of God. Moses went up there. He took Aaron a little while, a little ways up the mountain. And it was the same. Abraham was to take his son Isaac up the mountain. And so that is the place where God is revealed and people have an intimate relationship with God as ancient Jewish people. So that's not unusual. The gentleman that he put in the boat, his disciples are out floating and the wind comes up and a storm brews and they get battered and bashed about and pretty soon the boat is floated off shore. And if we read through this again, by this time the boat battered by the waves was far from the land. It's a chaotic mess. It didn't get past Jesus' disciples because they knew what that meant. That was a throwback to these Hebrew words. You want to learn some? Tohu vavohu. Formlessness and void. Pre-creative chaotic mess. We might even say a living hell. And that's the words that open up Genesis 1. A chaotic mess that God speaks and it settles down, and chaos becomes organized and contained. And here today, that's the same issue. And as this boat is being battered about, Jesus comes down from the mountain. He's had his time with his Father. He's had his time to reflect, collect, and prepare for the future. And as he does so, he says nothing, but he walks across the water and scares the bejeebers out of those disciples. And then he speaks. Then he speaks. Take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Words of comfort spoken into a chaotic mess of people finding themselves tossed about and battered about, floating away from the shore. Yes, they were fishermen and they understood how to, how to uh, maintain boats and, sh and sail and that sort of stuff, but this was far worse. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. When God announces his presence into the chaotic mess of your lives, what he's saying is, take heart. I got gotcha. you. And in that moment, and in that moment, Peter responds, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. The word being there is so particular command me. Give me an order. It was going to take more than just a simple invitation to Peter. Come on, Peter, it's, the water's fine. Isn't going to cut it. It's going to have to be God saying, get out of the boat and start walking. And Jesus does just that. I've always loved this text because growing up at what became Grace Lutheran Church until I was probably a teenager. It was First English Lutheran Church of Lake Benton, Minnesota. But when we merged with Diamond Lake, it became Grace Lutheran Church. And the picture that was in front of us every Sunday that was over the altar is the picture of Jesus looking down with his hand extended and Peter sinking deeper into the water, reaching up and grabbing hold of it. Of all my years of sitting at Grace Lutheran, the thing that, the only thing that gave me comfort 
about being there was that picture that God's hand would reach out into the midst of pain and suffering, death and despair, and grab hold and tug back. It's not a response that Peter made. He asked for a command, he got a command, and he failed. In faith, he failed, and he started sinking, and he reached out. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Three words from a man deeply sinking into the chaotic mess of pre-creation, realizing it's over. Lord, save me. And Jesus comes, reaches out his hand, and takes him back into life. Immediately it happens, in that very moment. And Jesus, in doing that, calms the chaotic mess and everything settles down. When Jesus reaches out and grabs a hold of you, he says, take heart. Take hold of me. I am life itself. Do not be afraid of what's going to happen. I am here with you to give you life. Peter gets yanked up. They go back to the boat. And Jesus, he says, you of little faith, why, do, why did you doubt? And if you read through that, it's not said in anger. There's no pointed words in the Greek that would betray anything except for a God who has sympathy for a man near death drowning. You of little faith, why did you doubt? If we take this text and turn it around and look back at everything Jesus had done up until that point, everything was a conversation about faith. Do you believe that the one who sows the seed planted it in you? Do you believe that the one who planted good seed in you realizes that the enemy is out there and he's going to have to deal with that bad seed that's been planted, but don't worry, he's going to take care of you? That's an act of faith. Do you believe that the kingdom of heaven has come? Do you believe that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, like yeast, like all of these things? Jesus is asking his disciples to step forward and believe, and this is the culmination of it. In deep despair, in a chaotic mess, Peter speaks for all of them. Lord, save me. And so Jesus does. It's often been said, especially since Sister Teresa wrote her memoirs, or they came out following her death, and in her book, she spent a fair amount of time talking about her wrestling with her doubts. And a lot of non-believers picked up onto that, or as I like to say, glummed onto it, and said, aha, see? As though doubt is the opposite or the antithesis of faith, doubt is a component of faith. Only people who doubt can have faith. Because you see, to have faith requires to believe in something beyond the mess you're in. And to doubt that doesn't mean to say there is no God. It just means at this moment I'm struggling. I am sinking deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the mess. Lord, save me. Doubt is what God deals with. Faithlessness is what kills people. And so Jesus ends this with this conversation about ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And they get into the boat, then everything calms down. And then they begin to worship him. You see, it takes an act of God to pull you from the mess of your life, to plop you back into living, in order for your eyes to be opened, your ears to hear, and your tongue to be loosed, to give God thanks and praise. To utter those words like the disciples did, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now we hear those words and they sit there. But I want to tell you something. Let them roll around in your brain for a while. Let them live there and take root. Let them grow into fruition. Because that is the same words that a Gentile soldier says coming next spring. It is the same words that come from people who've lived in darkness for so long and suddenly the love of God opens them to the light. Truly you are the Son of God. It is a confession. 
It's that confession that Paul is talking to the Romans about, about faith and life and eternity. The confession of one's lips, of the faith in their heart, is salvation. God comes. He's planted in you faith. He's watered that through the nourishment of Holy Communion, a community of faith, a life lived with Him. He is harvesting it in each and every day of your life when He comes and reaches out His hand to take hold of you when the world would rather stomp you into oblivion and raises you to eternal life in this kingdom to catch a glimpse of what yet lies ahead. So today, we join our voices to the disciples sitting in the boat in a chaotic mess. Simply repeat after me, truly, you are the Son of God. That is our confession. That is our statement of faith. Those are the words that the one who comes to save has planted in you so that in a chaotic mess, he can grab hold of you and say, Simply this, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Amen. This time I would invite you to rise as we prepare ourselves to confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We offer our prayers, trusting in your love for us. Hear us and give us what we need to be, to be true to the way of Jesus. Let us proclaim the gospel both near and far, in person and through digital means. Lord, in your mercy. When we experience trials and difficulties, give us strength to face them. Lord, in your mercy. Bring assurance and calm to any who are anxious or fearful, especially those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our bishops, Elizabeth and Anne, Amy, and we fill them, with, fill them with a joyful spirit. Lord, in your mercy. May God bless us with willing spirits and open hearts and flood our souls with peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As the altar is prepared for Holy Communion, I would invite you to sing hymn number 755, Jesus, Savior, Pilot, Me.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Let us pray. God of life, from the earth you provide us with wheat and grapes that become bread and wine. And now by your blessing they become for us the body and blood of Jesus who forgives all our sins and promises us eternal life. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty Father, who created the world in all its beauty and mystery. You sent Jesus to reveal your heart of love. By the gift of the Spirit, you empower us to be your witnesses and servants. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opens his arms to all. And the night before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in memory of me. When supper was ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, Father, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all people that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In memory of our Lord, we lift before you this life-giving bread and this saving cup. We offer you all those for whom we pray in this day, especially our beloved deceased who rest in the arms of your mercy and those from, whom our, from our parish whose anniversary of death we commemorate this week. Karen Antle, Mildred Swanson, Frank Dietrich, Pearl Matson. We offer you our own lives, May we be instruments of your grace and mercy in the world. Thank you for inviting us to be here in your presence and to serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Together, let us pray as our Lord taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. Please shake, greet one another with the gift of peace. Christ's table has been set, his feast awaits your presence. Come eat, taste forgiveness and eternal life. Let us pray. Loving God, once again you have welcomed us to receive you in these gifts of bread and wine. Thank you for your grace and mercy. May we go out this week to let your lights, our lights shine and so give glory and honor to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Loving God, bless our families and fill our homes with respect, joy, laughter, and prayer. Especially send your blessing upon Greg and Lindsay Winner, Robert Winner, Craig and Chris Weiss, and their families. Protect them, guide them, and deepen their love for you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive this word of blessing. The God of peace bless you, watch over you, protect you, and guide you on the path of life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, renew the earth. Thanks be to God. Our sending song for this day is hymn number 543. 543, Go My Children With My Blessing. <laughs> 